Good evening and thanks for dressing up for me tonight. You look splendid. Uh, and thanks for coming. It's a hard call. This is the um, night before. Well, we've got one more night and then uh, tomorrow night we have um, the end. And uh, you probably don't want to eat anymore. And tonight I'm talking about food and drink. So that's appropriate. Bush tucker, rheumatism, and buckets of grog. It may seem to be a strange combo, but it, uh, the three things that defined the bush workers in Australia. And during the 19th century, Australia, and to some extent New Zealand, relied on people working in the rural industries. We called it the bush, and the bush was really anywhere out of the cities. Anywhere that was in the scrub, we called the bush. So it also got connected to other words like bush tucker, tucker referring to what people ate. And um, we have to remember that in the 19th century, people didn't eat for fashion. They mostly ate for sustenance. So they weren't too fancy about what they ate as long as it filled their bellies, particularly the bush workers, the people that were involved in the shearing industry, the droving industry, the timber industry, the maritime industry. They all worked hard and they like to think that they played hard. So that's where the grog comes in. With the rheumatism in Australia and New Zealand, our primary industries were wool. That was the primary industry, wool. And it was hard yakka, we used to say, which meant hard work. And I'll explain the link with rheumatism as we get in. I'm going to sing a few more songs tonight than I usually would because um, I felt like it. Um, now, I want you to join in on one. This is a silly little song just to um, set the mood. It does refer to food. But the song itself is probably about three or four hundred years old. It's one of the great British and Scottish ballads. And you know that these literary works, anonymous works, which were usually about incest, murder, rape, pillage, were epic songs in the Anglo-Celtic tradition. But like a lot of the things that came to Australia, including our language, our music, early music. These songs had the stuffings knocked out of them. And by that I mean the ornamentation, the musical ornamentation that you find in English lyrical song, a folk song and ballad, or in the Irish and Scottish one. They lost their musical ornamentation. And it's my belief that this was to reflect more appropriately the harsh environment that these people lived in, particularly in Australia. Uh, and it's fascinating for me, as somebody involved in cultural history, that these songs were able to travel to Australia and be passed around in what we call the oral tradition. This one started life as the two ravens, or the twa ravens, and two blackbirds are having a, a sort of a bit of a session. And blackbirds in folklore, well, most birds in folklore have the ability to speak. And these two, in the original ballad, were talking about what would they have to eat. And one of them, and I like to think they're like Heckle and Jekyll, who I remember fondly from the cartoons, says, uh, hey, Heckle, what will we eat today? And Jekyll replies, well, there's a dead knight on the side of the road down there, let's go down and pick his eyes out. Because if you're a crow, that's the tasty bit. But when this song got to Australia, we didn't have those old myths and stories. We didn't have knights, but we had dead cows. So you have to join in on this. It's got a chorus. It's very difficult. Your bit is to be like a crow, which is a blackbird, and your chorus is, Ark, ark, ark. Do you need a rehearsal? 
Oh, two blackbirds sat on a tree. They were black as black can be. Ark, 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 said one old bird unto the other. Where will we dine today, dear brother? Ark, ark, ark. On yonder hills an old dead cow, I reckon we should dine there now. Very good. Well, they perched upon its high backbone, plucked its eyes out one by one, going, Ark, 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 said one old crow unto the other, Isn't this a tough old bugger? Ark, ark, ark. Well, the farmer came down with his gun, shot them all excepting one who went, Ark, ark, ark. Well, this old blackbird got such a fright, he turned from black right into white, going, Ark, ark, ark. And that is why you'll sometimes see a single white crow sitting in a tree going, Ark, ark, ark. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Yes, yeah, so let's start at the beginning. What did the convicts eat? Well, they did get rations. It's the only way when they dropped them in Sydney that they knew that they'd come back the next morning so they could do some work. And they fed them each day about a pound of meat. It was normally rancid salt beef or pork. And uh, they also got one to two pounds of flour each day so they could make a very simple bread which eventually in Australia became known as damper. Now um, the rations were tight, they did get some tea and sugar but no vegetables and no fruit. Later on if they were good or they were lucky enough to be indentured to some small farm they were allowed to grow their own bed of vegetables and fruit. So uh, that's how it worked. But the female convicts were given two thirds of what the males got. So there was discrimination from the very beginning. And most people believe that uh, women didn't need to eat as much. So they obviously weren't uh, witness to what went down today out there. So. And what about the Aboriginal people? What did they eat? Well, they had a belief that if it moves, shoot it, it might be good tucker. Okay. The word tucker, it's an brief, it comes from the English word tuck. You might remember Friar Tuck, who had a big fat belly on the uh, Robin Hood stories. Well, a tuck is your meal. That's where it comes from. In Australia, at schools, we have a tuck shop where the kids get their lunch. Okay? Um, then they did. They, if it did move, they grabbed it and they ate it. And they actually had a very healthy diet. The New Zealand Maori also had a very healthy diet. And they also had plenty of exercise, so they were pretty fit. In the early colonial cities, in both New Zealand and Australia, they had a lot of hawkers. There must have been a, a cacophony of sound in these early colonial cities because the time was shouted out with a bell. If anybody had strayed off and got lost in the bush, they'd make announcements, government proclamations, more bells, more screaming. And of course, the streets were full of hawkers selling whatever they thought that they could sell. In this case, fresh swans. Um, you wouldn't think to eat a swan, but uh, our colonial ancestors had a go at eating just about anything that they could. And they usually prepared them in such a way to emulate what they remember back home in England. So a swan would end up being in a Lancashire hot pot or a wallaby a little kangaroo would end up being like the roast beef 
of old England, not necessarily successfully. They used to say, Illawarra, Mittagong, Parramatta, Wollongong, if you want to become a orangutan, go to the bush of Australia. So most of the English made fun of these people that came out here. They didn't quite understand that um, it, there was great opportunity. Now, this is a typical bush shanty. That was a pub where they served mostly Jamaican rum and what they called Dutch gin. There were some ales, but obviously cold beer hadn't been invented. It is believed that an Australian did invent cold beer and put some ice around a tube. I don't know if it's true. Um, I like to think it was or is. But these, these bush huts um, were sort of, they popped up all over the place, particularly during the gold rush days. They had them in New Zealand too, and the, the liquor was pretty nasty. And I've heard of some people in Australia that used to use the slops and mix to, uh, tobacco juice in with it to give it some potency. And they were such hardened drinkers in the old days, they'd drink just about anything. Um, and they paid for it with their livers. I'm going to show you a few bush huts because it's a wonder, you know, these people had such um, necessities, the mother of invention, they say, but they didn't have nails, so they used dried bullock skin and they used it to wrap around the, um, the wattle tree bark and they made this mud called door, which they packed in to insulate their huts and they were a pretty rough looking hut but you'll notice also there that there's an Aboriginal woman there. That was quite um, normal for some of the early settlers to take up with some of the Aboriginal women. It wasn't seen as a bad thing by the Aboriginal people. Um, it, it's something that went on right through the colonial period. They used to, this stringy bark, they used to say stringy bark and green hide, stringy bark being the, 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 the wood, stringy bark and green hide are the mainstay of Australia. That's what they used to say. Now, here's a surgeon's car, a hut, which is um, a little bit more elaborate. You can see the way that they've made the, the roofing on it. Um, this would have been pretty typical of uh, a family dwelling in the bush. Uh, in this particular case, he was a surgeon. And here's a bush camp. This is a bush camp is uh, where they just set up a tent to service the drovers that were working, taking the cattle out to the nearby grasslands or the sheep. And uh, you'll see in this particular one that there's two camels. Um, we had a lot of Afghans come to Australia and they became hawkers. They would use the camels because of the dry continent. They'd put a little cart behind it and they'd go around the bush selling spice, curry. They'd sell cloth, needles, buttons, all those things. And later on nails. They, they, they had an extraordinary amount of uh, goods that they offered for sale. Um, it's interesting that today Australia has more camels than Saudi Arabia. We actually export our camels back to Egypt and to Arabia. Uh, it's extraordinary. They just went feral. There are hundreds of thousands of them out there in the bush. Okay, here's another hut. This bloke here is called 90 Mile Mick. He's known as 89 Mile Mick for short. And well, and he's got all the things you'd need in life there. He's obviously doing well. He's even got a fish hanging from his bark hut. Um, 